all over the world, people are in some kind of mental, psychological, emotional pain. What words have you heard around mental health? Crazy? Lost it. Can't keep it together. With that stigma of being labeled the other, the telling of the story, being able to say, this is what happened to me, is crucial. See, I write stories, I write them on my arm. Only I can read them, but the doctor calls it self-harm. So can somebody tell me it's okay not to be okay and do not tell me quietly, because mental health matters, and that's the reality. Just sitting down and listening to somebody, there's joy in that. <laughs> I can put a smile on, but inside feel completely broken. I don't tell this story from my own self-service. I've been through it and people need help. It's just something I accepted. To make that decision to receive help is not a sign of weakness. In today's world, more than ever, it is a sign of strength. People that acknowledge their mental health struggles, they're really like superheroes. I just frozen, I just... In front of us is a human being who's suffering. Treating people with dignity is the first act. I think it's our natural state to be connected. Fauzi and his friends are heroes. I really, truly believe that they are heroes. The results of this year will be felt for decades. For kids, families, husbands, wives, everybody. We're gonna hurt, we're gonna hurt together. Yeah, wow. Well, that was a really powerful film and a, a, quite a lot packed in there, to be honest. Um, it was, I personally found it really valuable um, and um, hope that you did as the audience. So I'll just introduce myself. I'm Leila Kogbara. I'm a director of Black Thrive Global and I'm going to be um, hosting the question and answer session today. Um, first of all, I'm going to just ask the panel to introduce themselves. Um, and then we're gonna go into uh, a question and answers. Don't forget to um, put any questions that you have in the chat. Um, otherwise, I'll just carry on chatting to the panel. Um, we have all got plenty to say as well. So um, off you go, Kevin. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Professor Kevin Fenton. I am the Regional Public Health Director for London. I work with both Public Health England as well as the NHS in London and I'm the statutory health advisor to the mayor of London. In my career as a public health doctor, I have had the privilege of leading mental health promotion programs here in England. And I've worked uh, locally and across London to promote good health, mental health and well-being. Uh, so I've worked with, um, and um, I, the event this evening has been incredibly fantastic just to raise issues around mental health uh, but most importantly, it's given all of us, I think, who saw it, a time to reflect on our own journey, our own well-being, and the things that we all need to do uh, to promote and protect our mental health and well-being. So I'm looking forward to the conversation this evening. Thank you, Lynn. Okay, um, I'm up next. I'm Charlotte Tahira. I'm a radio presenter and producer um, on BBC Radio One Extra. I also produce some podcasts, um, quite like cultural focused, um, some with social issues and current affairs for Sony and the BBC. Um, I'm a qualified teacher, so I've been teaching for the last seven years, both private education and um, in secondary and um, higher education as well. 
And I also produce and present my own podcast, uh, run events and help develop up and coming artists. Um, I think some of my biggest passions are uh, family, community and music. So they kind of are all the different threads in the things I do. And yeah, same with what Kevin said. I think this episode was amazing. It's really important to be talking about these things. And especially as I work a lot with young people, I know how important having positive and open conversations about mental health is. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Nathaniel Cole. I'm the co-founder of Swim Dem Crew. We have an inner city swimming club that uses swimming as a tool to empower people and foster genuine friendships. Um, I'm also a workshop, workshop facilitator, um, public speaker and writer focusing on masculinity, mental health, uh, relationships and sex ed. Um, all gearing towards young people. So I do a lot of work in secondary schools and trying to get young people, specifically young boys and young black boys to, to talk about what they feel and interrogate the reasons why they feel like that. Um, and yeah, to echo everyone else's words so far, really enjoyed the programme and excited to talk about it. Over to Jackie. Hi everybody, um, I'm Jackie, Jackie Dyer, and I'm um, one of the directors of Black Thrive Global and the chair of Black Thrive uh, Lambeth. And um, I'm also um, NHS England's Mental Health Equalities Advisor and also for Health Education England. And I'm the co-lead for the Thrive London um, Mental Health Prevention um, Programme that's been running for several, several years. Um, and I'm also most essentially, which has got me into this space, a lived expert by experience. By the way, I'm also a local politician in Lambeth and I'm the deputy leader of the council with the portfolio of job skills and community safety. Um, yeah, I'm a lived expert by experience in terms of my, my own mental health challenges and a carer for three siblings over three and a half decades with severe mental illness diagnoses. Um, and most recently, um, in the past year, the 1st of June is the first year anniversary of my second brother's uh, death. So it's quite a challenging time, our anniversaries. I know for so many people, and <clears throat> I got into um, involved in the series because I re received a letter as the, um, I am also the president of the Mental Health Foundation UK. Um, and I received a letter from Oprah inviting me to be on the advisory um, panel for this series because they wanted to make sure they had a international uh, panel of expertise, including lived experience and professional experience around mental health uh, challenges in order to make sure that the series was sensitive and had integrity. Um, so it's been a real pleasure working with Harry and, uh, and Oprah um, to support the development of the series. Um, and I feel really quite um, glad really as how particularly this first episode has um, unfolded. I think it's a real um, opportunity for people to engage with the subject, the experience of mental health challenges, um, sometimes that you don't necessarily get um, on a one-to-one -one discussion, but through the medium of, of a, a documentary or a series, it provi provides a sort of um, way of engaging. So that's, that's me. Thanks a lot, everybody, or Jackie and everybody on the panel. We've got an amazing panel. You're all amazing. I don't know how you pack so much in really. Um, and um, I think that, you know, we've got, we've seen this first episode, there were six in total. And we saw, saw at the end a clip of, of the, of Jackie Yu in the final episode, which is episode six. And one of the things that I'm quite curious about is 
obviously we've got a whole series hosted by Oprah Winfrey and Prince Harry, who are very well known people. Um, and in this first episode, which is called Say It Out Loud, quite aptly, Harry, Oprah, Lady Gaga share quite a bit about their personal experiences. So I'm just interested to know from the panel, do you think that celebrities generally, or these ones in particular, help or hinder ordinary people um, dealing with mental health issues? Um, so uh, we can start with the same order of the panel. So starting with Kevin and then going to Sharla and then I'll switch it around a bit maybe later. Well, Lila, thank you. You know, um, as a public health person, um, you know, we are always looking for credible voices, both patients and leaders, people from a diverse range of backgrounds, to be able to speak authentically about their experiences of health and mm -hmm. well-being, so whether it's on cancer, whether it's on HIV, and mental health is no different. And what's really important is that we're able to have diverse voices which are able to speak to the diverse experiences that we all have in a particular health condition. But what celebrities, if chosen correctly, can do is to amplify those stories, is to perhaps create less of a barrier between you know, them and us, and to begin that process of normalizing health issues. And if you look back over the last 20, 30 years, it's when we've had authentic uh, voices from not only celebrities, but leaders and others about tough issues. And I, my, my first pandemic was the HIV pandemic. And I so remember the power of leaders and celebrities, but also patients speaking about their illness that helped to address stigma and raise awareness. So I think celebrities have a role to play, but it does depend on the messenger and who your tar target audience is. Great, thanks, Kevin. Shala? Yeah, I agree. I think it's so important to normalize these conversations and take away the fact that they're celebrities because ultimately mental health isn't connected um, always to the job you do. Any, wh whatever job you do, you can have um, an, an ongoing up and down relationship with your mental health. Um, and I think it's so important uh, for the younger generation who are really heavily influenced by these public figures and these celebrities to see them talking about it and making it more um, just, just normal day to day conversation rather than, oh, because I'm really low now and I'm really bad in my mental health and now maybe I should talk to someone. Whereas if we talk about it every day, whether we're, we're having positive mental health or negative mental health, it just makes it an easier conversation to be had. Yeah, yeah. Nathaniel? Yeah, I think for me, it depends on the celebrity. Like in the past, and I'm sure currently you still have it with celebrities say that they don't want to be role models, um, but they are because certain expectations are placed upon them. So I feel you need like a few things to align in order for them to to help, you know, the, the movement about talking about mental health and, and changing disparities for people. So I think if they have, you know, a lived experience, whether it's through them or people they know, um, as well as a genu genuine interest in this, rather than, um, I guess, being absorbed by like it being in popular culture and then wanting to talk about it for its relevancy, I think it should be a genuine interest there. Um, and yeah, if they're, if they're seeking to amplify and, and, you know, make changes in the power that they hold as celebrities, and I think it can, it can definitely help move the conversation forward. Yeah. I mean, Jackie, you um, obviously worked with uh, Meghan and Harry, so um, I'll be interested to know how you found, it, found them. And obviously Harry's had quite a lot, lot of grief in this country about what people see as airing his dirty linen. So at the same time as people are saying, well, actually it's quite, a, it's good for us, for people to talk about it. On the other hand, other celebrities might be thinking, well, look at the grief Harry got from the establishment and certain parts of the press when he did it. So maybe I should just keep quiet. People are thinking, you know, stiff up a lip, you're, you know, you don't go and air your dirty linen. So I'm curious in terms of these particular two people, um, Jackie, what, what they were like, you know, how did you find them? And what do you think about that particular kind of criticism of, of Harry? So it was Oprah and Harry. Oprah and Harry. Um, 
Yeah, I think what's really what people have said, which is really quite the key to this, is about it's really important that a diverse set of people, whatever walks of life that you're from, so whatever label gets attached, be it a celebrity or be it a, a service user or be it some member of the community or a radio show host or some personality that's in more in the public eye than others, all have a relevant voice to add to this agenda and to speak on this agenda. And I think the key theme for me or quality that's really relevant in this agenda, agenda is bringing the humanity to the table. And the humanity is that we are both physical beings and beings which have a mental uh, world. So mental and physical health, um, rather than being separate and not one preferred to talk about than the other, mm. we have an opportunity to ele elevate both to a parity of status because we're paying equal attention to them in the dialogue. And that also helps to challenge the kind of worldwide stigma, which is really around um, the subject of our emotional well-being, our emotional distress, our emotional challenges, which essentially is the part of every, it's human experience. And then there, it lies on a spectrum regarding how good one is feeling to how poor one is feeling in, in that way. And I think that just to bring that humanity to it is, is, is what's really important. Um, but, and so the bit that I found, the thing that I found really um, very uh, reassuring and encouraging about Harry and Oprah is that's what they brought to all of the conversations. It was no, there was no airs, no graces. It was just as I am speaking with you, those kind of conversations when we were dialoguing about how we can make improvements, how we can uh, attend to each of the episodes, what works, what doesn't work, how, and there was a sense of valuing doing that in a co-creative way. And so, and so, yeah, so they were very human. And I think that one of the things that Harry was saying is like, you know that the media is going to have a field day. He's very sussed about the fact that this is where they will go. But for him, it's it, don't pay attention to that. Yeah. So along the way, he's learned not to pay attention. He's learning not to pay attention to that negative media. It's going to come no matter what you do because of for his own personal um, life journey. That's what's going to happen. But um, I'm, I suppose he's learning how to protect himself but to be able to emerge to be all of himself through being selective about where he places his energy. And yeah. so both were very real and human. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I am, um, I, yeah, no, I think that's true. I, 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 they did come across as very authentic, I have to say, both of them. I'm not a particular fan of celebrities or royalties and that kind of thing, but I immediately related to them as human beings. Um, and I thought that was quite interesting. We've got a question, a, uh, something, an, one of the, an audience member wants to talk a bit about the um, effects of racism on mental health. And um, we obviously, we know that um, black people are more likely um, to be diagnosed with mental health conditions, certainly when they're living in white majority countries. So just from the panelists, and you can answer in any order that, that you want to, what what do you think that's about? I think it links to like um, struggles that we go through that other races are just so oblivious to. So I could be in the car with my children. I'm fully insured. All my, I'm a legit. I'm a legit driver. I'm not got anything illegal in the car. But as I'm driving and I see a police car, I tense up and I get a bit anxious and I don't know why because there's there's no reason for them to pull me over I'm not speeding I'm not doing anything wrong but from such a young age it's been embedded in me that the police are dangerous and so you have to be careful when you're around the police and I think that's just one example of so many just day-to-day -day things that black communities go through that others don't um that make it to where we get get 
get more racism, even just like with the microaggressions, things like my name, Sharla, like always having to explain that it's not Shayla, it's not Sharla, it's not Shahala. Um, to colleagues who have worked with me for years, especially because I work in a predominantly white industry. So I think it's those little day-to-day -day challenges that in individually they're quite small, but obviously when they're consistent every day, it does have a big impact. Yeah. Um, any other panel members want to say something on this? I'd like to, to come in as well. I, I agree entirely with, with what you said, Shala. You know, we know that racism is, is common, you know, um, certainly in our country, in the United Kingdom, in recent surveys, up to 40% of respondents said that they would discriminate against somebody from a different ethnic background. And a third of ethnic minorities actually constrain their lives and constrain our lives in the survey because of fear of racism. And we know that hate crimes are a problem. They've been increasing over the past decade. And the vast majority of hate crimes which are on which take place in our country are because of race. So racism is a core of that. So in addition to the microaggressions uh, that we've been talking about, the little things that happen every day that make you feel unsafe, that make you uh, turn inwards rather than live your true self and be your true self. Remember that racism also creates the systems which uh, are systematically uh, preventing people from um, having full employment, from having equitable housing, from having equal opportunities, good education. And those aggressions over time have impacts on our mental health. They have impacts on our physical health and results in early death, more mental health, more challenges in our well-being uh, as minorities. So I think racism is real. And I think we're now at a point where we can talk about it. And it's not good enough just to talk about it. We need to be anti-racist. We need to begin thinking of how we tackle these systemic issues as well as the microaggressions. Nathaniel or Jackie, do you have um, any comments? Yeah, sorry. Um, I just feel like with when it comes to the effects of racism on mental health, like broadly speaking, obviously here in the UK, you know, if people don't experience racism, then they don't see it and then don't think it's real. That can lead to social implications for us in like our day-to-day -day experiences with people. And we're talking about things like microaggressions or invalidations of our of our of our being. And then there's also, I think, clinically, like a lack of understanding, you know, if we understand what our society is built on, like what Kevin mentioned before, then there's no reason why, you know, that trauma, pain, ignorance um, won't kind of filter down to all levels, including institutions. So I think it's pretty, <clears throat> you know, it's pretty simple when we think about the effects of racism or mental health are, are quite severe. Um, and it can often lead to people being not to services, not knowing how to, to deal with and, and manage someone um, because it's so kind of far from their, far removed from their world. Mm -hmm. well, that's right. And I think that, I think that another way of looking at, uh, at this is that um, in terms of um, systemic racism and relentless racism in, in, in its essence, that what, what we're talking about, and that this is what I mean by, systemic oppression, um, what I spoke of earlier, is that emotional distress is actually a normal response to something difficult. But what happens with this cumulative and relentless um, attacks on, on the bodies of black people and people of color is that it's, it's cumulative. And the medical model of mental illness actually does not attend to that. And so, because it would pathologize a distress, an emotional distress, which is really quite understandable if one understands some of the causes. So the absence of an understanding of structural factors and inequalities that create the conditions that we as um, racialized communities live under, um, of course, elevates our emotional distress and that can, uh, in, in some cases, elevate to mental illness. But I, I, I think that sometimes we get over, th there's a move or, or because the medical model is the superior understanding of 
um, mental uh, well, health, that actually it misses this more complicated um, understanding of racialized communities have a different source of trauma that medication can't respond to, in a sense, is, is, is what I'm saying. And we need to be much more sophisticated in how um, we uh, respond um, to, to that experience. And that includes um, being the source of leading some of those responses to our experience, something which doesn't take place very easily in a world which is um, very white supremacist. And it's funny, I was in a conversation earlier with a global network looking at youth justice. And one of the reasons that was proffered as regards why there's, because this is uh, worldwide, obviously, that wherever people of color are located or marginalized communities, they are overrepresented either in the criminal justice system or in the mental health institutions at that, at that crisis and coercive point. Um, and it was one of the uh, participants was saying, well, it's very difficult because white supremacists won't let go of white su supremacy yeah. to the extent that they are prepared to pay the price to their own lives for maintaining that exclusion and detention of, of black bodies or racialized communities. And this is partly what we're, what we're dealing with in these systems of oppression. And, and to be honest, you can't from, you know, you, what, what I find interesting from my own experience as, as for, after 35 years as a carer uh, for my brother who's uh, got severe mental illness is that I didn't realize that I was, it, this was a racial, I was having a racialized experience mm. until I saw the statistics. Mm -hmm. So I'm going, you know, you see yourself as an individual getting through and, and trying to, to, to navigate the system you don't realize that black people are less likely to get therapy, more likely to be banged up and over, over drugged, not likely to be assumed that they will ever be able to do a job, not likely, and so on and so forth. You just simply, until you see some of the data, it's like, that was a shock to me, like, oh my goodness. It never occurred to me because I wasn't assuming that I was having an experience based on my race. And so it's often we're seen as, you know, having a chip on our shoulder or something. And I would say, even if you don't have a chip, in fact, not having a chip on your shoulder sometimes can be damaging as well. Um, so I think that's quite an interesting uh, 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 thing about the way in which the, these uh, things play out in real life. And the other thing I thought was quite interesting in the program, uh, this particular episode, they're suggesting that speaking up is helpful. Um, do you think that stigma, shame, and not speaking up are particular factors for the black community? It's often suggested that they are, but I'm not sure actually what the what that is really about. What is really going on? So when we say, oh, there's just stigma in the black community, well, what was clear from the program is there's stigma in all communities. So is it worse for the black community or is it just a misunderstanding about what's actually happening for us? Um, Nathaniel, do you want to go first? Or Kevin? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I can go first. I don't mind. Yeah. Um, in terms of stigma, I feel like in in episode six as well, they talk about stigma being amongst uh, wealthy people as well as poorer people. Um, and obviously now we're touching on the fact that is it a stigma here or is it a stigma everywhere? I feel like it it is a stigma with us as, as it is with all other communities but when you lay it on everything else like what Jackie mentioned earlier about systemic reasons white supremacy all these other things interlink intertwine and add other layers of of, of pressure pain and reasons not to speak um you know if you think about things like the reason why so many people put stuff to the side is so they because they have to go to work doing precarious work so you, you add on like work factors childcare, all this sort of stuff then you can understand why it can be more of a stigma because if you're 
if you're being placed in a situation where you're you're stopping working stopping earning money and that sort of thing which is very linked to how you can care for yourself and care for your family um then we have a problem right and um, anytime people have to like stop work then there's an issue so it's either you work or, or deal with it and dealing with it will often fall to the wayside because you need to work um yeah. yeah I, agree. I feel like there's this um carry on and be strong well from my grandma and like my mother's generation more I think it's getting better but um I remember even when I was talking to my grandma about like feeling a bit low after having my daughter she was like you'll be fine and just kind of brushed it off and I think there was this kind of thing around just like being strong and carrying on because we can't afford to stop so I think that's where that plays in mm. I agree, and, and you know, I think having again worked in other health issues, I remember, you know, not talking about cancer in the seventies and eighties, not talking about HIV certainly in the nineties and the noughties, and certainly not talking about mental health. And I'm not sure if it's in our own community because I've seen the effect of stigma on globally, right? So I grew up in Jamaica; it's the same stigma around mental health. Mm -hmm. In part, I think it's I think there are issues of not naming things because of the ability of giving it power, power in our lives, power of others who know your business, who know about your vulnerability, and not vocalizing it becomes a source of strength. And that is even more important in racialized society where we constantly feel we need to be strong and invulnerable. Mm -hmm. And a chink in our armor becomes an opportunity for us to. Mm -hmm. To, to, be, to, to be taken further down. Mm. So to some extent, it, I don't think it's unique to our community, but I think there are factors such as our general unwillingness to talk about private matters, to share about health issues, mm. not wanting to be vulnerable. And of course, that practical thing of weighing up the costs and benefits. Mm. Who needs to what am I going to gain by doing mm. Yeah. And I know what I'm going to lose or what I think I may lose in going public with an issue such as mental health. Mm. Conversations such as these mm. are important because mm. the more of all of us who can talk about our own experiences mm. and our realities with mental health, mm. Mm. it's a bit of power and it takes mm. a bit because mm. it, from the space of fear into mm. well, can name it and therefore I can act on it. And that's mm. what the mentor is good to, to me mm. as well. That's so powerful, mm. you know, about naming, naming it, um, having a language to kind of like express what you're feeling and thinking and not being shut down or feeling that you're going to get shut down. And for me, there's something about how do we cultivate that dialogue on a regular level from the from from childhood all the way through that actually being able to talk about your feelings and what you think is something that is very empowering for, for everybody in a family and in a community. This is how we um, nurture one another and heal and grow. And, and, and it's just so, it, it, it's vital that we don't allow ourselves to be locked down in that way. I think some of the, so, so going back to how did we get like that in a way, if we think about this whole colonial imperialist kind of like journey, then we've been trained in a way to kind of um, deal with our pain in an inner way. Um, because the, if you express your pain and distress, and I reckon this is intergenerational trauma um, and intergenerational ways that we've learned to communicate with one another, pass down stories about how to cope with the, the societies that we're in, which are racializing us and treating us as inferior. Um, and that's something that's for me comes down all the way from, from mm -hmm. slavery. And we're still using some of those ways of trying to keep one another safe, which are inappropriate within this context and time and serve in a way not to nourish or, or, or strengthen us. And I think there's something about reclaiming who we are in a language about really being able to express ourselves and that our emotional distress when we is, is quite fine in relation to what it is that we are experiencing 
What needs to happen as a result is that we also need to navigate the way to transform the sources of the pain so that we no longer have to keep going on that, that journey of, of, of distress because we're living in systems that, that oppress us. So how do we emancipate ourselves individually, in our families, in our communities? How do we do that part of the work, which then will help us to have less um, uh, of the traffic the, the, the going to, going into the mental health institutions, going into the um, uh, prison criminal justice system, because we're we're kind of uh, imploding without a strategy to take ourselves out of um, some of these situations that are creating difficulties for us. And I think that's something that, um, as Black Thrive, that's what we're aiming uh, uh, to support our communities uh, to do. And that's really one of the reasons why I work in the way that I do in terms of national um, policy and activity to help transform at that level, but actually at a very local level, my focus, as is yours, uh, Kevin, around um, looking at the social determinants, but the social determinants through a racialized experience. So when we're talking about the social determinants, we mean housing, employment, education, um, our health, um, all these things are the things that if they, if we're able to access them, if we're able to have a positive experience of them, then they in turn will mean that we have a more likely to flourish and thrive as a community. So for me as a politician, what I'm looking at generating are those opportunities for us to, mm. to, to, to experience and therefore uh, to thrive. But that is not something that is really um, robustly understood, I think. Yeah, I mean, what you were saying just then um, resonates with what uh, Pauline Samuel has put, been putting in the chat at, at the moment. And what she was saying is that um, this thing about talking about the oppression and discrimination and the, the ease with talking about that. But in my experience, the things that I find hardest to talk about is humiliation. So I can talk about difficult experiences and things which are quite concrete. But I wonder, I think there is something about the certain, the nature of oppression, I think it is harder to really express the extent of humiliation that you might feel. Um, and, I've, and, I, and I wonder whether there's something about the nature of the d d uh, discrimination that has an impact. And then the other point that Pauline makes in, 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 the, um, in, in her questions or her comment is about the response of the system and mistrust and why would you trust the system with your mental health issues, given what the system is, you know? Well, isn't that the reason why we don't go exactly. and, re and, and, and look for mental health services? It's not just the mistrust, it's not just mistrust for mistrust's sake. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's There's mistrust some because of our experiences. When we think of Rocky Bennett, when we think of Oliseni Lewis, Sean Rigg, all these people have died, including my own two brothers, actually. My two younger brothers have died whilst in the care of mental health services who have not given them what it is that they need. They've given them this very um, less than mediocre service, which revolves around medication. Yep. So for me, it's about how do we um, uh, co make sure and advocate for better services um, for, for when people our people need them and be involved in the provision of those services and really cultivate services that are much more earlier in a way that services that are responding to what our needs are. So for example, when you said around the humiliation or shame, but actually some of that humiliation and shame for, from the perspective of a woman or the perspective of a girl or the perspective of a man, because actually there's, there's demasculation that takes place Absolutely. when you, there's all these different yeah. kind of components that come from the Absolutely. racialized experience that we need to attend to. But currently the system is not competent in that cultural way to be able to work with us therapeutically in that regard. Yeah. No, I, I don't agree. know what your thoughts are, are on that, Sharla or Nathaniel. I think um, even not only do they fail us, um, 
with our mental health, but even for example, my sister who has sickle cell, um, there's a lot of stigma when she goes into hospital around um, her pain relief to the point now that she will suffer at home in a crisis just to avoid going into hospital because she started getting panic attacks because of the anxiety around oh the nurses assuming that she's um, a drug addict. So it's like all these systems that are in place are actually not beneficial for us and are adding to the problem of our mental health. Um, and I think therapy, obviously we know it's expensive and that plays a part in the fact that even if you are struggling with your mental health, sometimes you can't access any services to help yourself. People don't know about the charities or support. And so then they just go unheard and suffer. So I think there's so many parts of this that, that adds to negative experiences for black communities around their mental health because the support and care is just not there. Yeah, no, true, true. Nathaniel. Yeah, and I think um, when it comes to support and care from a, a system or, or the state, you know, we have to we have to be clear of what we're asking for because, you know, Jackie, as you've alluded to, like I feel like the reasons why we're in this place is because there's so much hang-ups from a time of of slavery and we live under white supremacy, capitalism, patriarchy. So like if we if we don't change those things and we're still going to end up with the same issues, just recycling and and morphing into into new ways of oppression. So I feel like if we want the systems to change or the, the state provisions to change and we need to ask for, for bigger, broader, more clear changes, like, you know, can we improve mental health services under austerity? I don't think so. Um, there's um, Frank Keating, who's a, a great researcher, does work on you know mental health for uh, African Caribbean men. Talks about how even still, even up to last year, still feel services aren't um, up to standard, but community groups are doing better work um, to address our community. So actually, they need they need more support. Um, you know, we've, I think, look, we have enough data now to show that, you know, police don't want to be the first respondents to mental health crises, um, and they shouldn't be, and even, and there's been moments of them saying they don't, they shouldn't be the first people there on the scene, you know, what else can we do that's, that's maybe more linked with, with care, understanding, knowledge, um, and the idea that something isn't like a threat um, to help them, um, and also, you know, I feel in terms of how we get there there's there's some changes that could be made obviously over the last year lots of there's been lots of change about policies on, on flexible working office space office use that sort of stuff um and i think maybe if we could have you know something as an interim maybe thinking for the next 10 15 years um you know looking at what better mental health support could be mandatory for companies kind of like how you know pensions were implemented for for private organizations but you know I'd, I'd say meaningful pensions or you know meaningful mental health um, support that goes beyond like a you know a one percent sort of thing so I think the state kind of needs to put their, their money into these things and show them their worth for the wider public um can I kind of as we talk about you know what's needed for us it's like if you just think from the state or from a system society system point of view if you just treated um more of us with the care um, that you know, rich people or, or mass celebrities are treated with, um, then maybe you know, poor people are treated like that. And given the time to think, given the time, given the space, then maybe more provisions would be available for us. Um, I'm not sure if they're prepared, you know, for for what that means for them. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, yeah. I, I, you know, there's something about our experience going through this pandemic where so many of these issues, the COVID pandemic <clears throat> has brought these issues to the forefront. And this issue of trust is certainly been a big theme throughout the entire pandemic mm -hmm. from week one when people didn't want to go into hospitals because they weren't sure about you know, trusting the services, trusting the quality of care or fear of dying, straight through to hesitancy on the vaccine and, and the work that we've had to do with communities and led by communities to build trust and address hesitance around the vaccine. And I have to say, I've been in health for a long time. And this past six months, I've done more community engagement events with leaders of the NHS, with leaders of politicians and so forth, engaging with communities. And 
what we've uncovered is that communities are saying, you've never spoken to us before. This is what we've wanted. This is what will help us to build a trust in order to get the vaccine. But how do we then build on from this, what we've created now with this pandemic, to tackle other issues that affect us? on mental health, the fact that we're dying from diabetes or heart disease earlier than anybody else. Mm. And so many of my counterparts working in the, system, you know, in the NHS and the health service and so forth are saying, this is the ticket, this is what we have to do because ultimately we need to tackle this fundamental issue of trust, of listening to communities, of empowering communities to find solutions in order for us to get to a different place. And so I, I wonder, trying to connect a few things here, that experience that we're going through of mental ill health with the pandemic and this moment in time when things are thrown up and we're being forced to think differently. Now's the time for us to say actually how do we truly act differently uh, on mental health, building upon our lessons. From so so I, I, I think that's right and I think this so for me it's, it's always whilst the pain and the adversity and the challenges are really extremely difficult in terms of our experience, one of the things that helps with my healing is pulling together where the opportunities are. So that's aligning with what you're, 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 you're saying there. And there are opportunities. One is the patient and carer race equality framework around pulling forward mental health services. It's an anti-racism accountability framework for every mental health service provider. And we, the communities, can be involved in helping to shape that, hold organisations to accountable and co-create and get resource to deliver services that we want that's right for us. So that's one thing, and that'll be rolled out nationally next year. The other is around being really able to identify where those levers, additional levers, are kind of uh, 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 pre present. And actually continuing to have the conversations in the way that we're having uh, these conversations. So I'm hopeful, um, but that's also because I'm aware of what kind of things are being done in different places. There's something about how do we get the information out to our communities in a w robust way so they know where they can tap into so that they are empowered to be involved, to shape what they need for it to share the response to what they need yeah no thanks a lot panel we're going to have to wrap up now thank you that was a good uh, place to end and thank you so much one thing i would say is that i was an activist in the anti-apartheid movement and apartheid did end i am absolutely confident that we are going to win as black people it's a question of when and it's not, I don't think it's going to be that far away. It has to be in, enough of it in our lifetime. It's absolutely not good. And we will win because we're right. And we are great as people. We're great and we will win. Um, ultimately, we will win. So thanks so much, panel. That's really good. Um, the um, This recording of this is now is going to be available um, on demand after this. Uh, the recording is going to be available. So that's great. I would... Um, uh, I, I urge people to see the full series actually of this of this um, program because there's a lot of powerful stuff all the way through and also Jackie features in the sixth one as well for those of you who haven't seen it and there's also Siddiqui hopefully will paste um, paste the uh, links to Black Thrive websites in the chat as well so you can find out more information there about the panelists as well as about uh, Black Thrive and its activities and also I'd like to say thank you to Apple for making um, this screening possible so they, they charged and they gave this to us to be able to offer free of charge to the public. So that was great. So thank you to Apple and thank you to all of you panelists. Thank you. Thanks a million. Thanks to everybody who's um, come along this evening and uh, we wish you all a really, really um, safe uh, rest of the uh, month and year and uh, hopefully exit from uh, lockdown sooner than later. But thank you very much. Really grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the panel. You've been yeah. great. Yeah, you're a great bunch. We'll have to get you back together again for a 
a, 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 a re remake of the um, yeah. <laughs> We'd have to get you back together again for to, to do something because it's I think it's a good good mixture of a panel actually. Let's okay. see how we go. Thank you for sharing. Have we gone offline? Oh, we're still on live. Well, we can just chat, can't we? Um, while we're on live, I think it ends in, in a second. <laughs> um, I'll be running off then in that case. But I just want to say thanks for today. I really enjoyed it. Um, love meeting you all. And, and yeah, Leila, I should echo your sentiment of wanting to do it in real life one day. Yeah, real life. Um, Give, each other. Give each other a hug. <laughs> all right. Bye. Be well. Bye. Bye. It's an ongoing bye, discussion, um, everybody. Sorry, what's your name? No, I was just saying this is ongoing. So I mean, I'll catch up with Kevin at some point, and we'll see what we we strategize actually on this because it is ongoing. Kevin, so wonderful to see you tonight and to be with you, almost like being That's together, but we're not. And I can't wait for us to meet together again, especially with you know. That so much to talk about so yeah. much so much and I, mean, you as know. Far as well i am um, yeah i you know your it was Nat natalie from black thrive director in lambeth who said ah oh, this is somebody to and i was watching some of your stuff and i was like wow so yeah <laughs> i'm now a fan thank you yeah, this is sorry I got to go, but lovely to see you all. Shall I really love to meet you here? Uh, meet, meet you too, and nice hope to, to work again soon. Okay, lovely. <laughs> all right then. And Sharla, oh Sharla, proper. Yes, you're proper. That's all I can say on that. So lovely to meet you too, and look forward to working with you going forward. So yeah. I'm sure what we'll, we'll convene. What we need to convene to keep this on the agenda um and and, and I, I i do think that you're a great advocate in the space so let's keep this going yeah yeah thank Brilliant. you and thank, thank you so much. much okay then take care all right all right bye 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 bye, bye.